Very good. So now we have um, completed our uh, lectures on uh, error detection codes. And let's now see how they can be used in a, um, in a uh, protocol setting. Uh, so there was a question in the break, which was quite good here. Uh, so the question was, OK, what type of, what is the polynomial which is actually listed here? So this is the, the generator polynomial known as g of x in the earlier slides, if you, if you were confused about this. OK, now, um, going back to the good old OSI model, so we, we talked about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. So we have, uh, we have hosts, we have routers, and then we have uh, the network, and then we have another host. In the host, we have a number of protocol layers. In the routers, we have a, a fewer number of layers. Uh, some of these protocols are end-to-end, -end, the ones on the top here, and some of them are hop-by-hop, -hop, sort of, and these are called single hop uh, um, here. So now, uh, when we, we know that on the physical layer here, every now and then there will be errors, right? So that's just in the nature of things. Noise, channel noise will make it impossible to always communicate perfectly. So when doing end-to-end uh, -end, uh, and hop-to-hop -hop, uh, error control, uh, where should we put our emphasis on, on fixing errors? So, um, like a service feature, in general, can be implemented by a protocol end-to-end -end across the network or across every hop in the network. So, the question here that we ask ourselves now, do we want to control errors on a hop-by-hop -hop basis or on an end-by-end? -end? So, what do I mean by that? Well, if we go back to the, this here. Now, suppose that there is an error here on this a link here. Should we then try to take care of that here in one of these protocols? Or is it enough that, uh, say, the transport layer takes care of this, so detect this error here and try to uh, fix it? Okay. So it, it seems like um, it, it would be good to make error control uh, on every hop. Right. Uh, there are some advantages to this. The main problem with this is that uh, doing error control is also costly. It's not for free. So uh, the, the general consensus is the following, that hop-to-hop -hop error control, first of all, it's expensive. And a little bit surprising is that it cannot guarantee that end-to-end -end correctness. Okay. And the reason for this is that um, when when um, making uh, error detection and so forth on the bits that are coming out here, there's still some processing going up and down into this router where there could be errors introduced by the router itself. And then there will be erroneous bit going out here which would never be detected later on. Okay. So error control should be done Error control should be done always end to end, for sure, but then also on those links where we can expect errors, where we have relatively many errors. And we have relatively many errors when we do wireless links. Okay. Wireless is, is pretty bad in that sense. Wireless is super good for many, for many things, right? But it's pretty bad when it comes to errors. While if this is a fiber optical channel, these are usually uh, designed with very low error probabilities in mind. And therefore, there's less of a need for error control there. But for sure, we should always have end-to-end -end error control. OK. Um, so let's now talk about a technique where we guarantee error-free transmission under certain circumstances. right? Sorry, there is not a, uh, there is never a perfect system, right? So we should always be, uh, uh, there is always a need to expect or recover from errors. Okay, but the purpose is now to deliver a service, to provide a service that deliver packets, which has three things. They should be delivered in order, 
So there is a certain numbering of the packets and they should be delivered in that order. They should be delivered without errors and there should be no duplications. So these are the three things that we would like to do. Okay. And the basic element of this protocol, which is called an automatic repeat request protocol, it's a strange name and it has to do with historical reasons. It has no real meaning today, but it's just called ARQ protocols or retransmission protocols. And the basic elements that we need are, we need a good error detection code, we need a timeout mechanisms, we need special packets which are called ACK packets, control packets, Acknowledge pa acknowledgements, positive acknowledgements, and sometimes we ha also have protocols with negative acknowledgements. But for sure, we need one of these. So uh, we will work with systems where we have acknowledgements now only. Uh, today. Okay, so how does this work? Well, let's, let's assume what, what would be the simplest solution. If I have packets, I transmit this over a channel. I know that some, some of these packets will have errors in it. Okay, so what I do then is to in, in, uh, protect every packet with it or attach check bits or CRC bits, whatever, to each packet. Okay, and then I send it over the channel, and then the receiver will get a bunch of bits, like this, looks at these bits and see, okay, is this a code word or not? If it is a code word, then we think everything is okay, and then we send the packet up in the stack. If the, if the check bits, are, if, if there are uh, no, I mean, if the receipt bits are not a code word, then we know that these bits are indeed in error. So what should I do with them? If you're the receiver, you get some bits, you know that there are uh, errors in them. What do you do? What is the simplest thing to do? Erase them. Toss them, right? You know, junk them. You know, don't do anything with them. Just junk them. And let's hope that these bits will, you know, sometime it will come back to me, right? I don't want to deal with it. Okay. However, if, if, the, if the bits that come here, is indeed a code word, then I say, okay, no error, and then I send it up, and at the same time, I send a packet back to the transmitter to say, hey, I just received this packet, you know, thank you for the error-free packet. And me as a transmitter then, I just send the away bits, and then I get a receipt back, and then I say, okay, seems good, everything has worked. Now I can take the next packet from the layer above, put error detection uh, code bits on it, send it over, and wait for an acknowledgement. If I don't get an acknowledgement after, you know, I don't know, a few seconds, milliseconds, minutes, whatever, then I say, hey, you know, something, something is weird. I didn't get a receipt on this. I'll send it again, right? And I send it again until I get a receipt back. You know? So this, you know, seems to work, right? I get Packets from above, put some error, uh, error detection bits on it, send it over, wait until I get an acknowledgement, and then take the next packet and continue to do that. At the receiving end, I get my packets. Is it a code word? No. Toss it. Is it a code word? Send it up, send an acknowledgement. Right. And since there is a timeout here, I wait a few seconds, and then if I don't hear from the receiver, I know that something went wrong and I'll just send the packet again. Questions on this? Seems super simple. So what can go wrong with this? So let's see. Okay. This will not work. Okay. So I mean you, you can read for yourself, but this is essentially what I what I just illustrated. So uh, to explain what could be wrong here, we would like to uh, explain how these um, protocols works in terms of finite state machines. It's just a fancy way of encoding these words into a, a diagram which, where you can make some analysis on it. So a finite state machine is a machine where you have a number of states and there are a finite number of states. Finite state machine. Uh, it sort of starts by jumping into a state, let's call that state zero, and then something happens that triggers the system to go from one state to another, and when it goes from one state to another, it can also take some actions. And then uh, when we're in this state, we might have another event 
which doesn't change state, we remain in the same state, but we still do some actions. And then there is an uh, event three and so forth, right? And there could be many states here. Okay. Have you seen state machines before? Yeah, it's, it's, it's common to describe how uh, computer programs work and so forth. So, uh, and in particular, it's very nice when you have two computer programs that are interacting with each other. They both have their own states, and then they change uh, states uh, according to what they, how they interact. So that's why we use them here. So a finite state machine for our ARQ protocol is like this. So the transmitter has two states, ready or blocking. Ready means that I'm willing to accept another payload from above. From the, from the protocol above. Blocking means that I'm not willing to take any more from above. The receiver only has one state and that's ready. So we start here, we initialize this. So both the transmitter and receiver are synchronized and put, put into the ready state. And then things start. So at the transmitter, we get a service data unit from the layer above. And I get it some bytes from above, okay? And then the, the transmitter do four things, create and store the frame. Create means like adding uh, the check bits, headers, whatnot. S transmit the frame, start a timer, and then stop accepting new uh, service data units, which is basically going into the blocking state. Okay. Now, the upper layer is now blocked. It cannot do anything because I will not accept any more bytes from above. And then, uh, if the timer expires when, when in the blocking state, I know that something has gone wrong, or I think that something has gone wrong, so I retransmit the frame and I reset the timer. If, on the other hand, I get an acknowledgement from uh, the other side, and it turns out that these, these are also protected by error detection bits. So if the acknowledgement is wrong, there's corrupted bits in it, I uh, toss the acknowledgement frame and retransmit the frame that I already just sent and reset the timer. Okay, I never trust a packet with errors in it. Never. So the safe thing to do is just to toss it and hope that things will recover. Sorry about this. I need, really need to do something about that plinging thing. Uh, now, if an error-free act, however, uh, arrives, then I know that things have gone good. So I stop the timer, I remove the frame from memory, and I then start to accept new service data units. That is, I go into the ready state. So this is how one would program the transmitter. Two states, depending on what happens, you do certain actions. You keep track of your timer and things like this. The receiver, on the other hand, is even simpler. It basically, if it gets a, a frame which has errors in it, it just uh, uh, trash it, does nothing. If it gets an error-free frame, it delivers it to the layer above and sends an acknowledgement. That's all it needs to do. Okay. So that's a more formal description, or not a formal, uh, more formal, it's a more, I would say, easier description to analyze, in particular when you have more complicated protocols, you, you can draw these state diagrams and you have computer software to analyze these also. And now we won't be so advanced in this course, but this is what you can do at least. Now let's see how this works uh, when during normal operating conditions. And with normal operation, I mean that frames can be lost, uh, acknowledgements are never lost, and timeouts are longer than a turnaround time. So this third thing here is not obvious why this is normal conditions at the moment. It will be in a few slides, so don't worry about that at this moment. So we have a transmitter time axis here and the receiver time axis here. And this is nice, this timing diagram tells us a little bit on what can, what can happen and we can create things where things go good and things go bad. So the first thing that happens in this case is that the transmitter gets a service data unit and uh, it has number zero. It's the first in a sequence of service data units. This is transmitted over the channel with the header and some CRC bits. Okay, so this is typical encapsulation. We just take the payload, put some header, some check bits on it. The receiver, uh, okay, and at the same time we start a timeout uh, at the transmitter. So the receiver, 
uh, inspects the CRC bits here and everything seems to be okay. So it, it delivers the service data unit to its higher layer. Okay, so now the data has gone from the transmitter and has been delivered to the uh, higher layers. However, the transmitter does not know about this yet, but it will learn that by getting an acknowledgement which is sent over the reverse link. Okay. The acknowledgement also includes some CRC bits, and that's important because this, this data acknowledgement is also to be protected. Right? Uh, so that the, the transmitter side here can check that this acknowledgement was actually a correct, uh, correct, correctly transmitted. Okay, and then we get another service data unit. Now this is lost for some reason. So what's going to happen then? Well, after a while, the timeout uh, will uh, uh, exp the timer would expire. The transmitter would tra transmit the same frame again, and maybe this time it went over, and now the second packet is delivered. And we keep on going like this. Kay. So this is under normal operation. So here nothing has gone. Nothing can go wrong. But what happens if we violate these two things? Bad things happen. Okay. So, first problem, suppose we lose the acknowledgements. So, the initial was the same as before. A packet is transmitted, service data unit zero is delivered, but the acknowledgement is lost. So, what will the transmitter do? Once the timer expires, what's going to happen then? The transmitter will, will, will assume that the frame was lost and transmit it again, like this. Okay. So what will the receiver do at this point in time? Well, it would check the, the CRC bits and suppose that this was delivered error-free, what's going to happen? Send ACK. Send ACK. And more importantly, it will also deliver this payload again. This is bad, right? The same payload delivered twice. Duplication. Uh -uh. Not allowed. Okay. Okay. And therefore, lost acts lead to duplicate delivery of service data units. This is not allowed. What can we do about this? Yeah, so, I mean, if we have a numbering system here, a sequence number on these service data units, we can keep track of them. But remember that the service data units should never be uh, uh, interfered with. We should never be inspected by the protocol. But if we, in the header, put in some type of sequence number for the order of, uh, or the numbering of the protocol, uh, number of the STU we got from above, this will help us. And we will see that this is indeed the solution that we want to do. Okay. Second thing is, uh, is a problem when we have a timeout, where basically this means that the transmitter is, is uh, too overly concerned about lost packets, right? So if I send a packet and I don't get a response within a millisecond, I send it again, and then again, and again, and again. And if it anyways takes you know, several hundreds of milliseconds before this packet uh, is transmitted completely, then I tra retransmit uh, unnecessarily. Okay, so what's going to happen here is that we get several, um, we get uh, service data unit zero here uh, delivered, and we have a timeout, and it will be transmitted again, and uh, um, then uh, the acknowledgement will uh, reach the transmitter here. Uh, the same service data unit will be um, delivered again. Service data unit one will be then transmitted, and maybe this is lost. Now the problem is that the, an acknowledgement came from this service data unit and reached the transmitter within the timing here, timing uh, timeout. Uh, so the transmitter would say, "Okay, good. I got an acknowledgement. I just sent the frame. That frame must have arrived correctly." 
and then just move on to the next service data unit, number two, even though number one was never delivered. And we continue like this. So if we look at the delivered service data units, it's zero, zero, but no one, but two, two in this case. So here we have two problems, duplications and lost packets. Uh, both of them are, are bad, right? so we don't want to do this. So the solution to this is to use sequence numbers. So here's the main idea. Me as a transmitter, I will get packets from above. I will add my check bits to this, but I will also add a counter in the header, a sequence number to this. So this is a numbering system which makes sense for me, me as being the, uh, one of the protocol persons here. And then I transmit this over the channel. Um, so the main idea is that the transmitter enumerates frames with sequence numbers and the receiver includes the sequence number of the received frame in the ACK frame. So basically I, trans I get a, a service data unit from above, I call that number zero, sequence number zero. Send this over, the receiver gets it, checks if it's a code word, it is a code word, delivers that, pulls out the sequence number, put that into the acknowledgement and send it over here. So when I get an acknowledgement, I get a receipt, but I also get an identification of what packet which packet, uh, the sequence number of the packet that was delivered. So now I'm sure which packet has been delivered. Okay, so that's the main idea. So uh, both the transmitter and receiver then maintains uh, local state variables to keep track of these sequence numbers. I just knew which, which uh, packets I've been transmitting if I'm the transmitter and the receiver knows which packet they will expect as the next packet. Uh, so a common example of these state variables uh, is that the sequence number in the transmitter, and this is what we will use, the transmitter will keep track of the sequence number of the last frame that was sent. Okay. The receiver, however, will also have a state variable. It's the sequence number of the frame the next expected frame. So this is the sequence number we're waiting for at the receiver side. One can do this in different ways, but this is the convention that we will use now. And if you mess this up, uh, or rather, if one doesn't keep this straight, uh, it's very easy to get uh, very confused uh, in the future slides and also when you want to implement this in your, in your project, you want to keep, this tra keep track of this also, the meaning of these uh, state variables. Um, in practice, these sequence numbers must be uh, reused. So what that means is that the sequence numbers should fit in a relative small number of bits. Okay, so if we have uh, uh, m bits for the sequence numbers, we can have two to the power of m sequence numbers, right? Uh, so the smallest uh, we can have is a one bit sequence number, which is actually useful, but we can also have 16 bits or 8 bit or 7 bits. But we rarely have anything much larger than, I don't know, 64 bits or something like this. You know, I'm stretching here a little bit. Okay, so we need to reuse this sequence number, otherwise they will grow indefinitely. And remember, this needs to be fit into the header of the frame we transmit. So we, we don't want that. We don't want the header, headers to expand without limit. Okay, so in a protocol called stop and wait, which we will talk about now, the transmitter has a one-bit sequence number. Okay. And uh, that uh, state variable or sequence number is called S last. Sorry. Let's, let's start again. It has a one-bit state variable, it's called S last. And the interpretation of this is that this is equal to the sequence number of the last transmitted frame. Okay. So if the last transmitted frame, then we'll have a service data unit, we'll have some CRC bits, and among the header, it will have this state variable, or uh, sequence number, which is equal to the state variable. Okay. 
So this is the, la the number of the, the, the sequence number of the last frame I sent. That's S last. The receiver, however, maintains also a state variable, and that's called R next. Okay, so it's the sequence number of the next expected frame. So it is one. Okay, so if I'm as the receiver ex is expecting a frame with sequence number one, that means that I have already received a frame with sequence number zero. So it's one when the last received frame has a sequence number of zero. And it's zero if the last uh, received frame had sequence number one. Okay, well, if this uh, is confusing to you now, it's okay. It will be hopefully clear in a, in a few seconds or a few slides. And the acknowledgement frame then contains the state variable R next in its header. So when the, when the uh, transmitter receives an acknowledgement like this, uh, it's a, it, the meaning of this is that, okay, the receiver says, fine, I would like to receive a frame which has um, uh, R next as sequence number. This is what I want. So we can think of R next as, uh, as the requested frame, the sequence number of the next frame that I would like to see. So I want frame R next which implicitly means that I received a frame with S last, which is R next, flipping it uh, with one uh, uh, flipped. Okay, so if R next is, is one, then I just received zero. If it's zero, I just received one. Reasonably clear? Uh, it's, it's not rocket science, but it's, uh, you know, might look a little bit complicated as, as we see it here. Um, now, uh, these sequence numbers are used so that the receiver accepts a frame with sequence number S last only if S last is equal to R next. So this is how we use the sequence numbers. Uh, if the receiver gets a frame which is error-free but has the wrong sequence number, it will trash it okay, because it comes out of order. So this is the innovation now with the sequence numbers. So let's see how this works. In normal operation everything should work, so you better do it now also. So we have now uh, in, in, in addition to a time axis here where we put the, the um, uh, data units that we transmit and receive, we also have now sequence numbers and how they go from ones to zeros and zeros to one and so forth. We need to initialize everything. So this is the initialization. So before anything starts, we do this, okay? And this is consistent. So this S last me equal one, it means that, well, uh, I, I, I just sent a frame with, wha what does it mean? I, um, never mind what it means, it's the initialization value. And, uh, and it has to be uh, connected to this one. Okay, so let's see what happens then. So then we get the first frame, and let's call that frame number zero. So service data unit number zero. And then this uh, means that we will transmit this one now. Once I get this and transmit it, I change S last from one to zero. So this means that the transmit say, okay, my last frame that I transmitted had a sequence number zero, right. Okay. So the next thing that happens is that the, the receiver, uh, um, okay, there is a timeout, and then uh, everything went well, the receiver then accepts this, and then sends an acknowledgement, and then it should send an acknowledgement with uh, what it would like to see next, okay? It just received a frame with sequence number zero. So the next frame it would like to see should have sequence number one. So we change R next from zero to one, and then put this value in our acknowledgement. 
Okay. So now, um, at this point in time, when the transmitter received an acknowledgement with uh, uh, a sequence with r next equal to one, it means it tells the transmitter, "Aha, uh -huh, the receiver wants." a frame 1, which means that it rec already received frame 0. I'll take that again. The transmitter knows that the receiver wants a frame 1, which implicitly means that it already received frame 0. Okay. Now, when the next data unit arrives here, uh, the transmitter updates its S last. I mean, it goes from 0 to 1, puts 1 into the uh, header of the, of the packet that goes over the, over the network, and suppose that this is lost. A timeout hits here, and then it's transmitted again, and a timeout is there, and then at this point in time, the receiver gets a packet which has a sequence number equal to what it's looking for. And then it will accept it. And then update the sequence number to zero, which is put into the um, RNX will become zero, which is put in into the acknowledgement. And then the transmitter at this point in time knows, okay, the next frame that uh, uh, is requested has sequence number zero, which means that it has received the one with sequence number one. Okay. Any questions on this, how this works? Okay. The first time you see this, it's a little bit complex. I recommend that you uh, look at this slide until you understand how the transitions between 0 and 1 occurs at S last and R next, and how that affects the, the sequence number of the frames and the acknowledgement frames. Okay, so um, let's see now if the sequence number solves the two problems we had earlier with our naive uh, first uh, protocol namely the, the problem of having duplicates when the acknowledgement frames are lost and also have duplicates and lost frames when uh, the timeout is chosen uh, to uh, expire prematurely. So let's do that. Okay, so there's a another protocol here. So lost acts, I won't go through this in detail, but you can look at the slide and then go through this and make sure that you understand all steps. And, and, and then you will be fine. But essentially the problem here is that when, a frame, when an ACK frame is lost here, uh, the transmitter uh, timer would expire and then transmit the same frame again. However, at this point in time, the receiver will get a frame which has a sequence number not equal to what it expects. And therefore, the receiver would trash that frame and say, hey, I didn't want zero, I want one. Okay. And now the receiver at this point in time understands, say, okay, okay, you already received zero. So then I can, uh, then I know this, right? I don't have to send it again. So the next time I will send will be number one. Okay. And then number one is transmitted, and since number one now, it is equal to what we uh, uh, want, then we will accept this. Okay, so the receiver will never accept out of order packets. It would receive them zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, and no other order. Okay, premature uh, timeouts follows the same thing. Um, so <coughs> remember that uh, we delivered packet number zero and then the transmit is so nervous that it transmits this too early, transmitted already here. But then at this point in time, 
uh, the receiver would see, okay, here comes a frame with uh, sequence number zero, which is not equal to what I want. And therefore, I would just toss this packet. And I will uh, ask for what I'm looking for again, which is uh, a packet with frame uh, with sequence number one. I actually already asked for it once before, but you know, I'll ask for it again. It doesn't hurt to ask several times. We know this. Right? If you don't get it the first time, maybe you get it the second time. Okay, and then uh, at this point in time, then uh, the transmitter would know that, yeah, okay, you want frame number one, meaning that you have received frame number zero, so I can move on. Okay, except number one, and it goes like this. And, and uh, we will not have these lost frames, and we don't have these uh, duplicates anymore. Questions so far? Okay, so uh, this ARQ protocol is called stop and wait, where we have one bit sequence numbers. And uh, this uh, sequence number follows this logic that, uh, that was explained here visually. And let's uh, just write this down in, in text and also look at the corresponding finite state machine. And uh, this is uh, what you should implement also for your project. So uh, it should be useful information from that perspective also. So stop and wait. Um, um, Stop and wait basically means that, you know, um, um, I stop the, uh, yeah, what it means. It is the name. Never mind why it's the name. Uh, it could have been called something else, I guess. So we initialize, and this is important that in initialization is, is, is synchronized at both ends. So we, we, we need to negotiate a little bit where time starts and, and so forth. So there is a setup phase to this also. Uh, so, anyways, we initialize to setting s last equals to 1. And this means that the first transmitted service data unit will have sequence number 0. Then we're in the ready state and we wait for a new service data unit from the layer above. We up when we get that, we update um, uh, the sequence number, start the timer and transmit the frame with the updated sequence number. And then go to the blocking state. In the blocking state, we do not accept new service data units from above. If the timer expires, we reset the timer and retransmit the frame that we have stored. Okay. And if an ACK frame is received, we check first, are the error detected? Or if there is the wrong sequence number. So what is the wrong sequence number? Well, it's when R next is not S last plus one then we ignore this ACK. If no errors are detected and the correct sequence number is received, then we uh, uh, go to the ready state. So this is the transmitter side. The receiver side does the following, initialized with the sequence number R next equals zero, which means that the first frame to expect from the transmitter side has sequence number zero. Wait for a frame to come, check for errors. If there are errors, throw it away. If there are no errors, extract the sequence number. If the sequence number is the expected one, that is when if S last, the ones that, uh, sequence number of the frame I just got, is equal to R next, then everything is okay. We deliver the service data unit to the layer above, and we update the sequence number, R next, to R next plus one, and we send an acknowledgement with the sequence number R next. If the sequence number is not the expected one, that is, if S last is what, what we just received, is not equal to R next, then we throw away the frame and transmit an act with the sequence number R next. Okay, so basically, we, we send the act again and say, hey, I don't want this, I want, I want R next. I got something else. And here is the corresponding thing in finite state machine uh, uh, notation. And uh, this one should be a fairly complete description of what you want to do. 
So uh, let's see if we want to just see. Okay, okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll go through this, I think. Um, so we start by going into the red st uh, states here. So at some point in time, uh, we go into the ready state here and the ready state here, and we make sure that we initialize the right thing. So s last is equal to 1 here, r next is equal to 0 here. And then, when in the ready state, we get a new service data uh, unit from the layer above, update the sequence number, create and store the frame, start the timer, and transmit the frame. Go into the blocking state. While in the blocking state, a few things could happen. The timer expires, then retransmit the frame, reset and restart the timer. So this is what keeps things alive, right? If uh, things go bad, there are timeouts, and then you do something about it. Then we can also get uh, an acknowledgement, but the acknowledgement is has errors in it, or has the wrong sequence number. Then we toss this acknowledgement frame, uh, sorry, we retransmit the, uh, the frame and we reset and restart the timer. So here we go around also. And we can keep on going like this, retransmitting, 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 retransmitting. Eventually, there will be an ACK coming to us, which is error-free and has the right sequence number. Then we're happy and then go over to the ready state and then discard the frame that we had under transmission. We don't need to store this anymore. We can just release that memory. Okay, so this is the transmitter side. The receiver side is much, uh, 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 it's a little bit simpler. It only has one state ready. And uh, two things can happen. We get an error-free frame with the right sequence number. Then we extract the service data unit and deliver that to the layer above. We update uh, our sequence number and we send an acknowledgement with the updated sequence number. Or we can get a bad frame. What is a bad frame? A bad frame is something which has errors in it or a frame which has the wrong sequence number. In both of these cases, we discard the frame and we retransmit the act of the frame uh, informing the transmitter of what sequence number we would like to have. Okay. Any questions on this? Okay. Um, now, one can prove mathematically that this is a protocol that would deliver frames in sequence and error-free without duplications, which solves then the, the three things we wanted from these ARQ protocols. So this is a good one. This is a good protocol. It's, it's heavily used in practice. And um, yeah, so what why don't we always use this? Well, we will see a little bit later that when we do performance analysis of this, this is a great protocol under certain circumstances and it's a horrible protocol under certain other circumstances. So there are other ARQ protocols out there. So we will we'll talk about two, uh, two more, one which is called go back N and one which is called uh, selective repeat. But that will be a topic of, of future lectures. So if you're interested in sort of like a graphical proof of correctness here, uh, the, then you can look at the uh, last slides here. But essentially, um, um, what we do with these finite state machines is that they can only, they can only um, uh, go to then uh, send a new frame after the, the frame on the transmission that has been received correctly. So we can never, yeah, things can never go wrong here. There is one thing that could go wrong here, and uh, which I haven't talked about. And what is that? If you remember what we started about this lecture two, you know, two hours ago, we talked about error detection codes and undetectable errors. Yeah. So having received a, a, a code word, yeah. does it compare it to the, the code word that it actually sent to this? Oh, it's a code word. Yeah, exactly. So I think what you're aiming, uh, or, or let me rephrase this comment and question, is like me as a receiver, when I get a packet, 
I can only see, okay, is it a code word or not? If it is code word, then I would trust the content of it. And it could be that Git has also the right sequence number. And if it has the right sequence number, I will send this up, even though it might be corrupted. Okay? So these errors do occur, but they occur uh, uh, seldom, because we have, if we use the uh, strong enough error detection codes. But when they occur, this data will then flow up, and somewhere, somebody will look at the, the content of this uh, service data unit and see that it's all, uh, it seems bogus, right? So sometimes you have error detection on several layers uh, to protect about, uh, against this. But again, th this is life. Things can go bad and will go bad. And one has to do engineering solutions that are robust against errors and can recover from errors. That's always the case. Okay, but uh, let's um, stop here and uh, see you on Thursday. And by the way, you should be able now to uh, complete the project, part one and part two. So nothing stops you from doing this.